Hi, I am Bill Mould. I've been a master mechanic. A little background in aviation. I've been a college professor, seen here teaching an organic chemistry class, a lesson about thermodynamics. I built between four and 5,000 wheels of every conceivable type. Besides building wheels, my favorite time is spent teaching others how to do it. Now we're going to look at rhythmic tension cycles in wheels and the impact of crossing spokes. We're first going to look at the static forces on an unloaded wheel. The tension on the spokes are a force that pulls the wheel inward. Reaction forces by the rim that resist that compression oppose with an equal force the tension on the spokes. We have here a wheel where all the forces are in balanced and a static equilibrium. Here's another diagram showing only the forces of the spokes. Now when I put a vertical load on the wheel indicating in that arrow mass times the force of gravity, the opposing force called the normal force, which is the ground pushing up on the wheel, causes the rim to bend upward slightly. And that causes the tension on the spoke in the load-bearing zone to go down. I wanted to study this in great detail, so I built this test table in my lab. As I measure spoke tension, I read the results out to Carlos, my friend, who is recording that in an Excel spreadsheet. The rear wheel of the test bike is resting on a treadmill, and those chains run through a hole in the table. To a swing that has between 240 and 320 pounds of weights. 240 pounds on the bottom bracket results in 153 pounds on the rear wheel. I would now measure the tension on all 12 drive side spokes and then rotate the wheel 30 degrees to put another spoke in the bottom of the load bearing zone and similarly make 12 more measurements, rotate the wheel, make 12 more measurements. So I have for this test wheel at each position an average of 12 separate readings. Altogether I studied very closely the tension changes in 11 separate wheels where the variables were rim extrusion, hole drilling, lacing pattern, spoke thickness, and spoke tension, and I will show you the results of a few of those. Spoke tension is a force, and in the SI system, the force is measured in newtons. Now this is wheel one where I'm showing both the drive and non-drive side spokes. But what we're really interested in is the tension on the drive side spokes. Obviously, we can't have a wheel that has radial spokes on the drive side, at least not normally, but this makes a good test wheel, at least for the beginning. This is wheel one made with a velocity deep V rim, 24 holes, radial lacing, 2 millimeter straight gauge, velocity leader spokes, and a starting tension of 81 kilograms of force or 798 newtons. I carefully balance out my unloaded wheel so that every spoke has exactly 798 newtons. Here is a comparison of wheel one unloaded to wheel one loaded. You can see that as the spokes in wheel one come into the, the bottom of the load bearing zone, there is a huge drop of tension, about a decrease of 54%. The two spokes on either side of that also have a decrease. Other than that, the tension on the remaining spokes has gone up a little bit. Very interestingly, as we see here, and as you will see in, in all other cases, even though the tension distribution in the loaded wheel is quite different, the total is about the same. Here now is wheel 4. Wheel 4 is exactly the same as wheel 1, except I have raised the tension to 130 kilograms of force, or 1,273 newtons.
Here is wheel 4 with all of the forces in static equilibrium and wheel 4 as shown here is unloaded. Here on the right is wheel 4 under a vertical load and we can note that the tension on the spoke at the bottom of the load bearing zone although it has gone down it has gone down by less than half percentage wise from what it did in the case of the wheel with a lower starting tension. Once again, we see here comparing wheel four unloaded and wheel four loaded that the total tension is the same. Comparing wheel one with wheel four, we can see that wheel four with a much higher starting tension than wheel one has a much smaller percentage reduction of tension as the spokes go through the load bearing zone. Here is wheel two, the same number of spokes, low tension, but here I'm using race spokes, double butted spokes, instead of straight gauge. Our starting tension for wheel two is 785 newtons, which is about 80 kilograms of force. When put under a load, even though we have double butted spokes, we still see a precipitous drop of tension as spokes go through the load bearing zone. Total tension for the unloaded and loaded wheels is still the same. Wheel 5 is exactly like wheel 2, except I have considerably raised the tension on the starting wheel. In wheel 5, all of my spokes are set to a starting tension of 1295 newtons, which is about 132 kilograms of force. At high tension, my loss of tension on the spokes as they go through the load bearing zone is reduced. Total tension before and after is still about the same. And with double butted spokes, we see the same thing as we did with the straight gauge spokes, that the wheel with the higher starting tension sees a smaller reduction of tension as the spokes go through the bottom of the load bearing zone. And here we can see a comparison graphically on the x-axis is degrees of rotation. You see a sharp downward spike every 360 degrees and force in newtons is on the y-axis. On the left is wheel one, which was the supreme leader straight gauge spokes at low starting tension, whereas the one on the right is the same wheel except with high starting tension. Now, Professor Henry Gavin, a friend of mine and an engineering professor at Duke University, did some actual riding conditions of a dynamic results, and those agree exactly with my lab results, and I'll show you what Henry came up with. So these downward spikes correspond to the tension on the spoke or the length of the spoke going down as the spoke goes through the load-bearing zone. Obviously, as the spoke gets slightly shorter, tension goes down at the same time. So you see that this data agrees exactly and this picture agrees exactly with the graphs that I came up with. And I'll just show you this graphic. You see the little wheel there with the red spoke in the bottom of the load bearing zone and a red arrow at the top. As the red arrow moves from the left to the right you'll see the wheel go around one revolution. Now, is there anything different if my drive side spokes are crossed as I see here? Now, in this wheel, which happens to be wheel 7, we see the so-called pushing spokes in orange and the pulling spokes in black. And every place there's a cross like this, we have a forcible pushing of one spoke on the other. Let's compare these two wheels. They are identical in terms of their components. The only difference being that the wheel on the left is radially laced and the one on the right has a two cross. And we see a small reduction in the percentage loss of tension as spokes go through the bottom of the load bearing zone. Now I'm going to explain to you why it is that the expected effect maybe of one spoke helping out another one to reduce its tension change is not as pronounced as we might have expected. 
Here we see three wheels identical, all 36 spokes. The only difference being that the one on the left is laced up as a two cross, then a three cross in the middle, and a four cross on the right. We show here on each wheel the nine drive side pushing spokes, and now we're going to put in the first crossing spoke. Here, here, and here. In each case, the crossing spoke is immediately next to the spoke at the bottom of the load bearing zone. And so for my two cross over under, my three cross over over under, or my four cross over 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 under, the crossing point is at the same place in the wheel. If I make my hub flange orange and draw a line right here, then I find that I have three isosceles triangles, all of which look exactly the same. And here I've expanded them so you can see those three isosceles triangles as a close-up. So we can conclude the somewhat surprising result that there is little difference in spoke tension changes between wheels with a two-cross, three-cross, or four-cross pattern. Think of it this way when it comes to tension reduction of the spoke at the bottom of the load bearing zone. It's in a poor position to ask for assistance from the red spoke because the red spoke itself is coming into the load bearing zone and is already starting to lose some of its own tension. There is a difference in where the red crossing spoke attaches to the hub. Here it's at about the 7 o'clock position here about the 8 o'clock position, here about the 9 o'clock position. Here also we see a close agreement with Henry Gavin's dynamic on-road testing and my laboratory testing as a spoke goes through the bottom of the load-bearing zone, whether the wheel is laced radially or with a 2-cross, 3-cross, or 4-cross yields very little difference in the results. If you found this discussion interesting and you would like to learn more about some aspects of wheels that are not commonly understood, you might go to my website and take a look at this very deep dive into all aspects I could think of concerning bicycle wheels. Here is my contact information. Thanks for watching.